All my work falls short I got nothing new I could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every summer's day And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much Got nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I got one response I got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much Got nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah Come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul oh, Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh come on my soul don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah. Um, today, my friend Jeff Wiesinger, you all know and love, he is uh, kindly offered and accepted my invitation to preach again. And the beautiful part about him preaching today is that it is part two of what I started last week. We're doing a tag team teaching in my mind. And so, Jeff, please come forward. I'm going to pray for you and our time. So, Holy Spirit, Father, just fill Jeff.
that you would continue to just love on him and grow him and give him great words that are uh, your words, Father. We want to hear from you. And you can use Jeff if you want to. And help us to just fall more in love with you and to wrestle honestly with who you are and how great of a God you are. And to be open about where we are in our journey with you. And to trust you as we move through this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, as Kenny mentioned, uh, we have been friends for quite a while. We've known each other from the time, if I haven't met you yet, some of you are new. Uh, we knew each other back when we both served in Alliance Churches in Anchorage, Alaska, and Eagle River, Alaska, and we were neighbors of each other, got to know Kenny there, and it's exciting to get to continue our friendship and to be privileged to spend time and connect with you all. And uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in this time that once we picked the date, but after I listened to Kenny's brief <laughs> fireside chat last week, um, it was uh, just very impactful and very powerful, and there was something that God began to stir in me that I thought could be a bit of a part two to what Kenny was sharing. And I do want to say, uh, jokes aside, um, you are privileged to have a pastor that goes there. A lot of pastors don't go there. They stay on the safe, above the waterline realities of Jesus is awesome, he forgives your sins, life is neat, everybody move on. Um, but Kenny is willing to talk about the hard things. And Kenny and Emma are such a blessing and a gift to your community, I know you know that. Um, but I want you to know that I know that from uh, the ability to see a lot of churches and a lot of places that uh, give a safe place to say, I don't have it all together, I'm struggling, I'm wrestling. And when your pastor models and leads that for you all, it's an incredible thing. And that's a true gift that you guys have to be able to be partners with him and his family on this journey. So... So uh, Kenny talked about limbo, about how to keep that conversation with God going. What is life like when it's just uh, tasteless like dry rice cakes and you're struggling in your relationship with God? And I had a, a major period in my life when limbo is about the best word I would use to describe my faith, my ministry, and my personal life. And it was uh, what was really a 16-month-long depression, I've mentioned it a couple of different times as I've spoke, in which uh, I was about as emotionally checked out as you can possibly be. Uh, I was drained. I was going through the motions of leading a church as its lead pastor, uh, but there was no joy, no experience of Jesus no delight in him. I knew the truth. The truth was something I was utterly convinced of. It wasn't that I stopped believing, but it was dry, rice cake reality for me in trying to walk this reality out. And it was miserable and unpleasant and probably more even in some ways unpleasant for my wife to have to have a husband who was so checked out emotionally and in every way. So as I struggled, one of the things that ended up happening, and I think God brought me there for good reason, is he took me to Psalm 88 at some point in my journey. And uh, I, I don't want to, so a little quiz. Anyone know what's unique about Psalm 88 as compared to just about every other, as compared to every other Psalm of the 150 Psalms? Something about Psalm 88 is very unique. Anyone know what it is? If you don't, it's okay. Just... I didn't know until I stumbled across it. Kenny knows. He'd like to brag and say that he knows. So <laughs> Psalm 88 is the one psalm, and there are other psalms that end with, may the wicked get their just desserts, but Psalm 88 is the one psalm that ends without a reflective measure of hope or a but yet at the end. It ends in pain. It ends in heartache and difficulty, and that's where the psalmist leaves us off. And we're actually going to read that psalm together in a minute, but I, I'm always curious, and I like to do a little bit of a learning base for myself whenever I get to a psalm. And Psalm 88 is also very unique in that it's not a name you often see listed in who the psalmist is. And his name is Heman. 
It's not He-Man. He's not one of the masters of the universe. It's He-Man. And uh, this is called a mascal of Heman. So what on earth does that mean? A mascal is something uh, just very simply in Hebrew means an expression of wisdom and contemplation. It's something to reflect on and think on that helps us understand God and how life works a little better. So when Heman wrote this psalm, this is what he wanted us to understand. But who even was Heman? So I call this the long dark night, not Batman, not the dark night, but the long dark night of the soul that Kenny mentioned in St. John of the Cross. And so just a couple of references to bring him up. Here are the men who served together with their sons from the Kohathites, Heman, the musician, the son of Joel, the son of Samuel. That name probably rings a bell. So Samuel, the prophet that ultimately anoints David to be the king over all, Heman is Samuel's grandson. And so this is the grandson of Samuel. David, together with the commanders of the army, set apart some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jedathan for the ministry of prophesying, accompanied by harps, lyres, and cymbals. So those that came after Heman from his family were also those who were those uh, who perpetuated this uh, place of wisdom, understanding, prophesy, music. And then the next, he was wiser than anyone else. They're talking about Solomon including Ethan the Ezrahite, wiser than Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. And you go, oh, well, so he was a lesser guy. Who's he being compared to? Solomon. Anyone think, remember what Solomon's title was? The wisest man that walked the earth. If you even get to be in the company of and described along with, uh, with Solomon, what are you? You're a person of great wisdom, discernment, and understanding. So Heman is a person that is well-regarded and well-known. And he writes Psalm 88 for us. And so he helps us wrestle with this question. What do you do when you don't see and can't find God? When the knowledge in your head, when the word you read, when the pastor up in front tells you he's there... But all you feel is the aching silence you're terrified is going to consume you. Now, honestly, some of you are not resonating with this. The journey you're on and the place you're in, it's a sweet place, a place of reassuring affirmation that God is with and alongside you, and it sustains you every day. And I'm glad you're in that place. And I would say my life has been marked more often in that place recently But that's 16 months, nothing. I literally described it as God taking me off a shelf, saying, okay, Jeff, you're going to do this ministry pastoring thing. You're going to preach. You're going to counsel. You're going to do whatever I've got for you to do. Okay, you're done. Now you're going to go back on the shelf. And my whole life was, okay, I guess that's what life is like. I believe God is good. I believe God is love. I have no experience of that. But even if this is it for the rest of my life, God is God. And if that's what he has for me, that's what I'll walk into. It's not like that now. It's not like that today. And I'm grateful for it. But many, as Kenny was talking about last week, whether it's an extended period of time or it's just a few weeks or a few days even, it can be overwhelming when all of a sudden you're struck with this idea of what if this is all it's ever going to be? And it's not going to change. For people like that, their faith is no less genuine, no less sincere, no less seeking. But for whatever reason, they just feel this gaping maw of silence when they reach out to the God who they are told they believe in and loves them and that they love. But it just seems like a one-way experience as you try to relate to him. And if you're in that place today or remember that or have seasons like that, hear this, you are not alone. Your brothers and sisters in this very community, your pastor as he shared, me as I share, have felt in different times feel that experience. And so if we're going to enter into this Psalm 88 passage, I want us to feel the weight of it. And I think the best way to feel the weight of something is to experience it firsthand. So we're actually going to read this together. I'm going to read a part. It's going to say leader. 
And obviously we'll read that part, but the part that says body, that is your part to read. And I'm just going to be honest with you, you're going to, I hope, feel and go, ooh, what's it like to experience God the way that's being described by human right here in this passage? So let's read this together. I'll do the leader part, and I'll say the first couple words of the body part, but then I'm going to let you carry it. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am. I am set apart with the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, who you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have... You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord. Every day I spread out my hands to you. Do you... But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath... Darkness is my closest friend. Amen. You're dismissed. No. So, not going to see this on the K-Love verse of the day, are you? It's a hard passage. It's a hard word to feel, but I am so grateful that Heman, one entrusted with sharing the wisdom and contemplation of what it means to walk with God, gives us times and seasons like this where even he says, from my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. We don't honestly know what that means in the life of Heman. We're not given the historical context to know and grasp that, but that's how he contextualizes his life, yet is entrusted with what? Writing songs, giving us words of wisdom, prophesying. It's not the people that have it all figured out and who are on top and who are feeling great that are called into this place. It is sometimes the ones who are in the darker places who share their wisdom, their understanding, their discernment of what it means to continue to pursue and seek God just as I wrestled how to do in the deeper, darker places. So why might one be in a Psalm 88 experience? Well, traditionally, there is a way to understand that that the church can go to pretty quickly. It's what Job's dear friends went to when he was in a difficult place. Well, it's probably sin in your life. It's your fault. You've done something wrong. That is not impossible or inconceivable that that could be very much part of the reason that persistent disobedience and rebellion can cause heartache and pain. The next slide here in Psalm 32, David writes this one. When I kept silent regarding his sin with the Bathsheba, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Sin and rebellion against God can cause suffering. It can cause a sense of feeling weight and guilt and shame because we're walking in unrepented sin. Now, I would say for a lot of us as Christians, even as we repent from that sin, we have voices of shame that hold on to us. That is a very different thing. 
That's part of what Celebrate Recovery can help us maybe deal with and face. But for some of us, we do have secret lives that are having us in a place of heartache, shame, pain because of the choices we're making. What's another reason we might be in a Psalm 88 place? Well, self-righteousness. I mentioned earlier the idea of the elder brother, that famous story of the prodigal son, the brother that had it all together and did everything right and was angry and bitter and hard-hearted towards his father and filled with resentment when the father said, look, everything I have is yours. You've been with me this whole time. But something in him was saying, I've done it right. I deserve more. I've tried to walk in this way. I've, done a, I've been a good Christian. They would have used that term, but I've been a good Christian and look at the life I've got. Self-righteous elder brothers or sisters have succumbed to the gospel of the manageable life. A semblance of control, there's that word again, rather than engagement with the living God. And I'm going to tell you, Oftentimes, the self-righteous elder brothers don't often experience the absence of God's presence because they haven't really been looking for it all along. Because God is not a loving person to relate to and engage with. God is a set of principles to follow to make life work better. And so we don't experience that absence, and even though it might be achingly there, because he's more of a concept than one we relate to, and thus deeply miss when its absence is felt. It's easy to stay insulated from this kind of pain until what happens? The system breaks. I was doing the Christian life, and it worked well, and then I lost my job. And we couldn't pay our mortgage until I did start online gambling and it was just for fun. And all of a sudden I'm tens of thousands of dollars in debt and I don't know how to get out until I started that affair, until I had this thing that happened, until a diagnosis came and thousands of people prayed. But I'm getting worse, not better. This isn't the deal, God. <laughs> I signed up for an I would follow you, and I didn't expect life to be perfect, but it should work. And what happens when it stops working? And I start going, huh, maybe I didn't really know God. I just knew, as a phrase that I've heard a lot lately, I didn't know his face. I just knew his hands. I knew what he offered. I knew what he provided. I didn't know him. Might be sin, might be self righteousness. Sometimes it's just a deeper sanctification process where loss and heartache are the formative placers that take you deeper into the heart of God. The rich young ruler got invited into that when Jesus said to him, Take everything you have, sell it, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. It wasn't the money, it was what are the things that your heart longs for and cries out for most? I follow the commandments, I've obeyed my father and my mother, I done, haven't done the bad things, what do I still lack? You have an attachment to something that you have to let go of in order to really experience me. And, the, and that rich young ruler did what? Walked away sad. Sometimes a Psalm 88 experience, and I think this marks Heman's life, is a unique purifying call of God to a purpose that we sometimes only get glimpses of on the backside, as Kenny talked about last week. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he only experiences the voice of the enemy as he's tormented for 40 days. Abraham's painful journey to the top of the mountain when he gets asked to sacrifice his one and only son that was supposed to lead to the generations that produced thousands upon thousands. Paul, who was told, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake when he was struck blind and had to be prayed for to have the blindness lifted, blindness lifted and later crying out for a thorn to be removed only to be told, my grace is going to be made perfect in your weakness. 
It was contained within Psalm 88 and Psalm 22 is what Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it's David who wrote it first in Psalm 22. And David has numerous psalms in which he cries out, feeling the absence and loss of God's presence. St. John of the Cross, that long dark night of the soul that Kenny referred to last week, and one of my favorite quotes that I love that describes and was honestly a sustaining word, though it was not scripture, it was something I held on to as one who loved Jesus, found in C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, if you're familiar with that book. The Screwtape Letters is a book that kind of turns reality on its head. C.S. Lewis wrote a book in which a senior demon is writing to a junior demon about how to tempt and torment people. And so, you know, the enemy is God the Father. Our Father is actually Satan and everything. You got to kind of reinterpret it through this lens. But he talks about this period of dryness in the life of the person this junior devil was assigned to torment and how even though he's really happy about the dryness, but in the midst of the dryness, he still continues to worship, to read, to pray, to seek God. And the names of the screw tape is the senior devil, Wormwood is the junior devil, thus the name screw tape letters. And screw tape writes, don't be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy, God the Father, our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys and chooses to follow. And when my 16 months, I was like, amen, amen. I'll choose to follow. I'll choose to obey. I'll choose to believe in your love. I'll choose to believe in your goodness. And there was a purifying reality that God was seeking to do in me in that journey that I wanted to enter into and I wanted to follow him in. And as Kenny talked last week and I talk about this psalm, there's now a a way I want to talk about what do you do with what Kenny shared last week? It was beautiful and it was powerful. And the one simple thing that I hope I can do today, if you get nothing else out of anything else I say, I hope you get this language to talk about that kind of pain and it's called the language of lament. So if we go on to the next slide. I want to talk to you about movements, and I'm going to be very honest here. The church that I'm a part of, Salem Alliance Church, has been actually doing a series on lament and has talked about, and I have very clearly ripped off some of that sermon series to share this with you. So I want you to know that. But I loved what we were doing in that series. We're actually writing laments and sharing them in our small groups. And I love this concept because the things that Kenny talked about, for some of us who have words and ways of expressing ourselves, we can just naturally enter into that space. Some of us go, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Kenny. That's me sometimes. I don't know what to do. I just, I feel stuck. I just feel like it's rice cakes day in and day out, and that's the way it's going to be. The language of lament is a beautiful way of being able to enter in and express some of the things that we feel that are intentional and purposeful in how we share them. And so um, as we look at the movements of lament, I want to say this. These are not logical, sequential movements. I have completed level one. I will now move to level two. Now that I have secured level two, I will enter into level three. And now that I've gone through three, I will get to four, and then I will be done. They can often flow in and out of the different expressions of lament, depending on where we're at, and that's okay. It's okay to be in like, I was in a space of complaints and bringing things honestly, and we'll talk about, can I complain to God in a second? But um, 
And then I go and I ask boldly and I feel like I chose to trust, but then waves came on me again and then things hurt and I got frustrated and I wanted to again say, hey God, what's the deal? That's okay. This isn't a one, two, three, four and done. I want to say this very clearly about lament. Lament is grieving, feeling the depths of the hurt and the struggle. We don't walk through lament so that my thing can be fixed. Oh, I lamented. Now, God, I need a job. It's okay to ask for the job, but the closure of lament is not the resolution of the issue. The walking through and the process of lament is choosing and surrendering myself to the deepening work that God wants to do in my life. If it also leads to getting the job, to being healed from cancer, to my relationship to my spouse getting restored, praise God, all the better, that's beautiful. But we don't lament to make life work. We lament to encounter first and foremost the presence of God. Exactly what I loved about the young woman's biography. What, Marcy? Marcy's biography, the autobiography she wrote. You need to know first and foremost it's about my relationship with Jesus. That's why we lament, because we authentically enter in. And so... As we look at these four movements, and that's why I chose very carefully not to call them stages, there are ways in which we move in this experience of lament. And I'm going to talk about them briefly through Psalm, briefly through Job, and then I'm actually going to share mine, because you may be like, how does that work? And I'm going to share the one I wrote. So we very first turn to God. Well, isn't that kind of logical? Don't we always turn to God? Maybe you're like me, and when things go bad, and they go bad, or they're difficult long enough, I don't turn to God, I turn inward. And I try to figure it out, and solve, and resolve, and try to figure out, even if it's, what do I need to do with and about my relationship to God, I'm not turning it to Him, I'm trying to figure it out. (laughs) I'm trying to get the answers. And I heard a lot of that language is what Kenny shared last week. And we can all struggle and wrestle in that place. And the psalmist feels like death as we read that together, that there's no hope and there's overwhelming pain. And I can't reconcile what I'm going through with what I know. But where does the psalmist start? Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. Let me ask you this question, and you can't answer it, neither can I. Was Heman saying that experientially or out of conviction of who he believed God to be? Or maybe was it some of both? Because right there, as he's writing that psalm, he doesn't feel very saved. (laughs) But he believes God is the God who saves. Maybe he has experiences in his past where he remembers He grew up reading the Torah and saw the stories of God's intervention in the life of Israel. And God does save and has saved. And even if he isn't right now, he turns to God. The first movement of lament is getting honest and looking right to and at God. Not at ourself, not at our problem, not trying to figure it all out, but looking to God. The second thing, Bring your complaints. How many of us have been told you shouldn't complain? How many of us have told our children you shouldn't complain? How many of us had our mothers lecture us you shouldn't complain? I would invite you to read the scriptures and see how many people complain. Now, do we end up complaining? No. But complaining is an honest reflection and reality of the state in which we are and the pain and difficulty that we are feeling and experiencing. And if we do not turn to God and tell him where we are honestly at, 
We are unlikely to ever come to deeper places of intimacy and connection because I go, well, I can't complain because God is God. He's holy and good. I'm in a hard spot. If I'm upset, then the problem must be me. And so I just need to check my attitude, grin and bear it, and say, well, God is good and loving, and I can just move on. Or, like Job, like Heman, like Jesus on the cross or in the Garden of Gethsemane, like David over and over and over again, we can say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. This actually seems unfair and painful and I wish it would end, and I wish it would change, and I don't know how it's ever going to change. When you look at what this uh, human writes here, you've put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depth. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends have made me repulsive. I cannot, I can't confine and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. You did this to me, God, is what Heman is saying. You put me here. Now, do I know the exact way? I don't even know exactly what Heman's describing. None of us do. But whatever he's walking through, he believes God has put him into this place where he cries out and seeks, but all he knows is suffering. It's hard to be in that place where we struggle and wrestle, whether it's months and years or even if it's those few days, are we willing to stop and turn to God and bring our frustrations of what those days of rice cakes feel like and say, God, it's hard. I don't like it. I remember times of connection with you and I don't feel that anymore. And I'm willing to bring my complaints the third movement, ask boldly. After what I just read, Heman writes, I call to you, Lord, every day I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do your spirits raise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Save me. Deliver me from this. It is okay to ask. We are told over and over in Scripture that it's okay to ask, to cry out for healing to cry out for a sense of his presence, to cry out for financial provision, to cry out to see broken relationships reconciled, to cry out for more of him. I need you. Those 16 months of depression, for me, there was so much going on that was refining that God did need to purify and things I was holding on to. But I had a beautiful, wonderful wife who loved and supported me. I have two adorable children, young children at that time, who I was so proud of. And I had a church that generally, most of the time, loved and supported and was there alongside me and was, was with me in what we were trying to do. It wasn't like my circumstantial world was falling apart, but I was falling apart. I felt broken. I felt not good enough. I felt like a failure. I felt all these things. And so I would cry out and saying, God, I need to hear and see and know who you are in the midst of this. Because honestly, life ain't that bad. But I feel like I'm dying little bit by little bit every day. Ask boldly. It's totally okay to do that. The fourth one. Ah, this one sucks. <laughs> Choose to trust. Remember what I said about lament. The goal of lament is not to get the thing fixed and resolved. The goal of lament is to draw nearer to the heart of God, first and foremost, and perhaps the thing will get resolved too. But it's first and foremost to choose to trust God even when we don't know the outcome. That was one of the hardest spaces for me that my journey out of that, my wife helped initiate it lovingly, a conversation with our district superintendent, a relationship with a spiritual director I walked with for nine years, a journey of healing prayer and restoration of my life that was slow and methodical and difficult and painful. I didn't have a this kind of moment, although there were some profound encounters with God along the way. And God began to shift my heart. And 
it's not all done, the tensions and struggles, as you're going to hear my lament in a minute, of what I wrestled with about my ministry experience. But I began to experience and know the presence of a God who loved me, and I had to choose whether or not that depression ever lifted to say, God, you are good and loving, and I choose you now no matter what. And then I had to do it again and again and cycle. And I didn't even have this language at the time, but I was cycling through these all the time, complaining, asking, and choosing to trust until I didn't feel like trusting anymore. And I would complain and turn to God, and I would have to choose to trust all over and over and over again. Verse 13, Psalm 88, I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. There's a famous passage in John chapter 6 that's one of the more difficult ones of Jesus' life where he's gathering steam and many people are choosing to follow him and he starts to introduce this concept, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which is what all good leaders say to win friends and influence people. <laughs> then you have no part of me. And people begin to get a little weirded out and a lot of the peripheral people start to walk away and go, I don't think I, I signed up for bread and fish. That's what I was on board with. And if this gets the Romans kicked out, I'm doubly on board with it. Let's be the strong, proud Jewish nation we once were under David and Solomon's reign. Are you going to do that, Jesus Messiah? And free fish and bread along the way? Sweet. There might be some hardship, suffering, yielding, surrendering. That's not what I was down for. And so many of them exited. And then he turns to his disciples and says, do you want to leave too? I don't think that was like a teaching moment for Jesus where he was like, oh, I'm going to see what my disciples think. I think his heart was being pulled he was struggling because he saw people that said they believed when the cost of what it meant to know Jesus and to walk with him and understand him was being revealed. People started to walk away and he said, do you want to leave too? And Peter, if you remember his words, said, to whom else should we go? Would we go? For you have the very words of life. And I remember in my own journey going, I don't have other options. Not because I was so noble and righteous and pure, because I was so just convinced of the reality of God, even if I wasn't experiencing it, that the idea of, you know what, I'm going to ditch this ministry thing and just pursue pleasure and sex, drugs, and alcohol just didn't make any sense to me. And for those that have wrestled, I'm not diminishing that. It just, that logically, it just didn't make any sense. I'm like, God is God, even if I don't know him. I have to just choose to pursue and walk with. That's what I have to do, even if he doesn't show up in my life the way I want him to. Mark Vrogop says, this is where all laments are designed to lead. If it doesn't end in choosing to trust You've not lamented, you've just been very sad. It's easy in a broken world to just stop it being very sad. To say, life's not working anymore. Hey God, here's what's going on. I'm not happy. Do this. It doesn't happen. Okay, I guess God isn't who he said he is. Or maybe I just keep going to church, but it really doesn't mean anything anymore because when you really need him, he's not there. The invitation to lament is to surrender to choosing to trust even when the future is uncertain. I just want to take one minute. When you think about our good friend Job, who no one had better reason to lament losing all his children, all his property, and then losing all his health, what did Job do? He turned to God. He began by saying, shall we accept good from not God and not suffering? May the name of the Lord be praised. That's how the journey began. But boy, did Job let loose with the complaints. 
Better my mother was told the child did not survive than what I'm going through now. I wish I'd have been stillborn. And that's one of about 127 things Job says in those next 30 chapters about the journey of pain and suffering. Ask boldly, if only there were a mediator who could lay his hand on us both. And aren't we glad that that mediator did come in the person of Jesus? But Job didn't have that and no. And he said, this is not happening. We need somebody who can be a go-between us, God. Someone that can intercede because the gulf is obviously way too big. And yet Job chose to trust in perhaps one of the most famous phrases, though he will slay me, yet I will trust in him. Even if I were to die, I choose to trust God. And even in that beautiful passage in Job 42, after he's heard the voice of God, and Job um, says, I spoke of things I did not understand that were too wonderful for me to comprehend. I put my hand over my mouth and keep silent. It's easy for us to go, oh, well, yeah, Job got everything back. He said that before he got everything back. He was still covered in boils. He still had no children. They were all dead. He still had no property, no goods. Yes, everything got restored, but his choosing to trust was far preceding when he experienced the blessing. And let's just remind ourselves, even though he had more children, he still had 10 dead children. That doesn't wipe that away. Lament is a painful reality. And so... I want to be, this is, you know, I loved Kenny's prayer. God, speak to us. And if you want to use Jeff, that's fine. Um, More pastors should have that prayed over them when they speak because we get to thinking that our brilliant words are going to fix people. So because I'm not the originator of these four movements, I'm going to encourage you, write these down or take a picture. If you need language to start telling God and meeting God in the things that Kenny was talking about last week that he was describing. Because as Kenny described and I continue to describe, all of us in our journey have seasons, some brief, some lengthy, some feels like almost lifelong, where we're going to have to walk through places and seasons of lament. I want to end by writing, uh, reading to you the one I wrote. We took time in our small group to talk about these four movements. Mine is about my ministry career, 31 years long, 23 years as a lead pastor. I still struggle with, well, I'm just going to read it. And so here's what I want you to understand about this lament. This lament is going to end with uncertainty, just the way Psalm 88 ends. It's not fixed for me. I don't have final answers like uh, who wants to be a millionaire. I don't have a a final answer moment. But God is walking with me. And after this, we're going to pray. And then the worship team is going to come back up and lead us in worship. So uh, I do not do this, but I'm going to announce the movements just so that you can see where the shift is. I don't have these in my actual words. Turning to God. God, I feel like I've circled around this for two plus years since coming to Salem. I left professional ministry and I'm at peace with that. I feel grateful for my life and what I'm doing now. But I look back on nearly 31 years of ministry and I'm asking the question was it worthwhile? I believe that I truly love people. I was present to them, I cared for them, supported them, and I pointed people to Jesus. I believe I shepherded well, but God is the pastor. I don't know if I led the church well, if I advanced the kingdom through where I served. I feel like I need to spend time with you, lament to, and I hope with you that although I shepherded people well as individuals, I often feel that I failed in leading the church. I can hear dissenting viewpoints, especially Darlene's, in my ears, but I need to meet you here, Lord. Bringing your complaints. This is hard because my bent is to shame myself, 
to say it's all my fault because you're God, you don't make mistakes. But God, I did give myself so passionately to this. I prayed, I stretched myself, I did so many things outside my nature and my preference. I spent so much time seeking, praying, longing to discern and ask for your heart and your vision and God, how I began to and still hate that word so much. And what came of it all? How many people came to faith? How many in the churches I served truly were transformed? How was our community changed? Sometimes it feels like little on all counts. Yes, I was flawed and the people in the places I served were imperfect, but God, I, we tried, and maybe we were just another little church that believed in a big God, but had little happen. It's still easier and safer to assume that the problem was just me. Ask boldly. How do you ask when it's in the past? Boldly, I want you to do what, God? I want to frame my understanding of what came of the of, of what came of and what was done through your eyes. And honestly, that terrifies me. Because I feel like I, quote marks, know the answer already. But my heart is afraid that if you were to reveal yourself, you'd say, Jeff, you're a two-talent guy that I gave a ten tip. Excuse me. Jeff, you were a two-talent guy that I gave a ten-talent call, and you made a half-talent more than you had before. You'd pat me on the head and say, oh, at least you tried. <laughs> Thank you for that. You missed a lot in your ego, and your need for self-validation was what defined most of it. Even after becoming healthy, you helped to close the church in Lincoln to merge with another. It was just the wrong place, the wrong call, you missed it, but thanks for trying so hard. Part of me screams that that isn't how it was, but I'm full of doubt that I let you and the churches I served down. I want to ask to hear your heart in this so that I can live in the light and peace of your perspective and your kindness, which permeates just about every other area of my life, save this one. Let me see as you see, Jesus, even though it scares me choosing to trust. So what is choosing to trust? It's believing that you are moving in people, that you are moving in the churches I served all along. It's in relinquishing my self-perceived right to be the final judge and to instead hear your heart for me in that I want to create the space where I can listen. And if I'm honest, I'm still a little scared that you will be kind, but still say, Jeff, it could have been so much more. I'm wanting to trust that people were loved, that people saw the heart of God better, that they cared for their neighbors, that they spoke words of the gospel because of what we collectively did at the churches where we served together. I'm by no means there yet, but my heart is ready to sit with you and listen for the only voice that truly matters. I've carried this round long enough. It's time to lay it down and bring it before you. And just to give you context, uh, May 17th through the 19th, I have a weekend retreat booked at Mount Angel Abbey, a monastery outside of Salem, where I'm going to spend three days alone with God and spend time with him around this very question. I wanted you to hear that story one, because I wanted you to know it's okay to share your story, not that you have to share with everyone else, but with God about where you're struggling. And secondly, it's okay that it's not fixed yet. I don't know what'll happen after that weekend. I don't know that it'll be fixed then, but I want to be present to him and with him to hear his heart and his voice. So my hope is that whether it's those few days or a few weeks or months or years that you've been wrestling with, that maybe these four phrases give you a context to bring language to your own struggles, to your own things that you're dealing with, to the wrestlings that are on your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you that you walk with us in our difficult spaces. I hope people hear from what was just shared that 
I recognize that from Psalm 88 and from the life of Job and from my own story that you are the God who is good, who is real. And Lord, I've experienced so much healing and restoration. And yet there's this area in my life that I still have these glasses. I see it. And I don't know if it's good or accurate. I don't know if it's flawed. I don't know if I messed up completely. But what I need more than answers, God, is you. I need to sit with you. I need to be present to you. And all of us, whether it's little laments or medium-sized laments or great big laments, need to be courageous enough to come before you and say, God, here is my heart. I turn to you. I share my complaints. I ask boldly. And God, I pray that rather than just being very sad, I choose to trust the God who is good, the God who is loving, the God who is kind. May each one of us have the courage to walk this road. And thank you for the Bridge Church in Kathlamath that has leadership that says, it's okay that we do this. Yes, it's hard, but God is good and he is with us and he will give us strength to walk this road with him and with one another and that this is a safe place to do it. Bless this church on this journey, and may it be a model to this whole surrounding community of people who are willing to go to the darker, deeper places, not to get fixed, but to meet God. May this be said of us all. Amen.